Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom, and we've been talking about the book of Daniel. The nation of Judah has been carried away into captivity in Babylon, which brings us to the writings of the prophet Jeremiah regarding the Babylonian exile. He said... Let me sum up, because I'm pretty sure we're going to read it later. <laughs> but real quick, the quick version is seek the peace of the city. Like, you're going to be there a while. Get used to it. Plant a garden. You're going to be there a while. That doesn't sound very encouraging. <laughs> well, it, it only doesn't sound encouraging if you're thinking of things in terms of human victories and human standards. Yeah. I mean, I think a garden is always a victorious thing. Like, it, it, it uh, speaks to well, my agrarian soul, Thomas Jefferson and all that. <laughs> well, there's also something just very, I don't know what the adjective form of Genesis is, but um, oh. very back to the beginning. Uh, yeah. Where God is essentially saying, look, you're going to be in this rough situation. Go back to the beginning. Do what Guess you what? are Your supposed to do. Your job is still what it was. That's so yeah, interesting. Still I had not thought about dress that. Dress and keep. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, I I think of it that way because that's it, it's essentially what we're still doing today. We're we're still dressing and keeping the places that we've been given, whether or not they're actual gardens. I mean, my wife and I have a garden in our backyard, and we've been very um, tickled. Uh, <laughs> to, to use a term off the top of my head, by the parallels to Genesis and and what yeah. what humanity was originally meant for. My uh, English teacher in college once taught a class on horticulture in literature, <laughs> which I wish I had been able to take that class. It was a schedule conflict. But one of my favorite references is in Voltaire's Candide, which I hate. I hated the entire book. Well, but the last line. Yeah, well, I'm just, yeah, I, I don't dig Voltaire. But the last line of the book is, we, so we all must tend our garden. It's kind of like, well, here we are. I'm like, yeah, you got something right there. Greg, you've been very quiet. <laughs> well, I'm just enjoying listening to you to talk. Ramble on here. <laughs> and, you've, and you've given me uh, a really good idea, something I did, did not address at all in the original article. Uh, first of all, the whole back to Eden thing. But it's not quite back to Eden because... Mm -hmm. It's build houses and dwell in them and plant gardens and eat the fruit thereof. Something new. Mm. Houses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have the gardens and the orchards and all of that, but we've gone a little further. Now, here's the thing. The houses that they were living in were almost certainly not houses they built. Mm. They were houses that the Babylonians built and they got stuck into. So does it still work? What happens when the pagans obey the dominion mandate after a fashion and they plant the gardens and they build the houses and they dig the wells. Surely they are now contaminated for God's people and we <laughs> wouldn't dream of using them. We should all be Amish and go back and start really at the beginning. Go How far the back do you want to go? <clears throat> well, that's kind of the problem here, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. How uh, God's people tend to be very inconsistent at this point. We don't want anything that smacks of the world genes. I mean, actually, there are some people who, do, who are opposed to genes because in certain mm -hmm. segments of the country, at least 20, 30, 40 years ago, they were too worldly, especially on girls. Mm -hmm. TV, yeah. yeah. Uh, phones, oh. And I remember when cell phones came out, one gentleman came to me and complained, "This is there's a deep evil here. This is designed to, <laughs> to put a block between the, the generations. It was funny, a a few weeks later to see him standing on one side of the road during school pickup and his wife on the other talking to each other on phones. Like, <laughs> yeah, I could walk over and say, hi, dear wife. Oh, um, man. We are always suspicious of culture, especially when we didn't build it. And something that Jeremiah is saying here, and we'll, we'll get the background here in just a second, but something he is saying is not start fresh. Okay, you're in a new place, so get rid of all the traces of Babylonianism and start fresh and, and be content until God calls you back to the promised land. <clears throat> it's your, and, and this, this is something that, that is in the notes. You're living in a pagan city dedicated to a pagan God. 
it's, it's been mapped out by magic. There's a ziggurat in the center. It's built on the very uh, foundations of the original Tower of Babel. Doesn't so, get more ungodly uh, than that. <laughs> yeah. As far as yeah. externals go, that's pretty bad. And yet God's response is, um, so, mm -hmm. settle down for a while. It's going to be 70 years. So with that in mind, let's go back and look at the story just a little bit. Uh, people, the, 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 first cap, the first phase of captivity had taken place. That's why we're jumping in here. Daniel and his friends had already gone. Uh, Jehoiakim had gone and been reinstated and then replaced by Jehoiachin or Jeconiah, or depends how you want to pronounce it, you know, who had um, gone into captivity. So we're, we're, we're winding down here to the very last days of Jerusalem, that presumably Zedekiah is on the throne. But the city still stands. The temple stands. The palace stands. There's still an heir of David on the throne. And people are hopeful. And in the midst of this, God sends Jeremiah that says, I've given, I've, I've given all these lands to Nebuchadnezzar. Submit. Bow to him. Obey his laws. This is the way it's going to be. This is what I have ordained. And, and that didn't go over too well. <laughs> uh, um, and then God told Jeremiah, well, make some yokes, uh, big, big wooden yokes, and um, wear, the, wear one of them around. Eventually, he sends some to other kingdoms to say, put it on. It's the, it's the yoke of Babylon, in other words. And all you other countries submit, but particularly now to God's people in Jerusalem. He's wearing this thing around, looking kind of funny. God does that to his prophets sometimes. <laughs> and um, the message is, bear the yoke and it will be all right. If you submit to God's chastening, it'll be all right. You, Jerusalem does not have to fall. But after a bit, there's another prophet, a man who at least claims to be a prophet, has a reputation as such. His name is uh, Hananiah. He comes to uh, Jeremiah and says, uh, I, got a mess I got a new message from God. The captivity is going to be short. Within two years, Jeconiah and all the people and all the temple buses, they're all coming back. Well, this is almost over. We just got to hang in there a little while longer. And it's all coming back. And Jeremiah looks at him and says, um, Amen. The Lord do that. That'd be great. Wonderful. Love the message. However, all the prophets that have gone before you and me prophesied of war and plague and famine and complete desolation. That's just what prophets do. Because God's people don't exactly have a track record of being faithful, do they? So um, I like your message, but I am suspicious. And uh, when it comes to pass, the prophet who prophesies peace, when his words come to pass, then we will know that this was the word of the Lord. Hmm. And Hananiah gets very bold and takes the yoke off of Jeremiah for, rather forcibly and throws it to the ground and breaks it and says, thus saith the Lord, I've broken the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, all the people are really impressed. It looks really dramatic and all that. Jeremiah isn't quite sure. He's, he's got his suspicions, but sometimes God is unaccountably gracious. Well, all grace is unaccountable, but, you know, <laughs> he's, he's been prophesying doom and gloom. And he, has God really changed his mind? I don't know. Well, he goes home and God comes to him and says, yeah, that was not me. <laughs> I did not send that <laughs> message. He made, he broke your, your yoke of wood. Make a yoke of iron. Let's, let, mm. let's really uh, put an exclamation point on this one. And as for Hananiah, he's going to die real soon because he's taught rebellion. He's falsified prophecy in my name in order to lead my people into rebellion. So he's gone. And that brings us to what you were talking about earlier. God tells Jeremiah, look, let's get this straight and let's let people on the other end know what's going on. Write a letter and tell them. This is not a two-year captivity. This is a long captivity, not an eternal captivity, but by human standards, fairly lengthy. And this is what God has, at least part of what God has Jeremiah write. Well, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, and to all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon, build ye houses and dwell in them. And plant gardens, and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives, and beget sons and daughters. And take wives for your sons, and give your daughters 
to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished, and seek the peace of the city, whither I have caused you to be carried away captive, and pray unto the Lord for it, for in the peace thereof you shall have peace. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams, which you caused, which you caused to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely unto you in my name, for I have not sent them, saith the Lord. For thus saith the Lord, that after seventy years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you, and perform my good word unto uh, my good word toward you, by causing in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall you call on me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your hearts, and I will be found of you, saith the Lord. And I will turn again your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. Well, there, there's more, and it keeps on going. <clears throat> Uh, did you notice that a couple of those passages uh, haunt the uh, hallways of Christian memes a great deal? <laughs> yeah, I've noticed that. Um, I know the thoughts that I think to you. Thoughts. I know of, the plans that I have for you. Yeah. Plans to prosper. On every Christian graduation card ever. Yeah. You shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your hearts and I will be found of you. Very common verses, wonderful verses, but the context mm -hmm. is after you've waited 70 years... <laughs> yeah, God has a plan. It's a good plan. It's a plan for for your your welfare. But it's the the part that you're interested in isn't going to go into effect for 70 years. God's already got the pieces moving, the machinery's cranking, the current's on, seeds are in the ground. It will take 70 years to mature. In the meantime, yeah, the things we talked about, build houses, plant gardens, eat the fruit of them. Take wives, beget children, take wives for your children, so that you can grow. This is the time to grow and not to shrink, so that when it's time to come home, there will be more of you. That's the plan. And pray for the city. Pray for the city. Now, you it's a pagan city, city. that's built on pagan gods and yeah. all of that? Interesting. Oh, isn't it? It's... Um, it was a hard pill for those in captivity to swallow. And so part of the message God includes is, he, he already had implied this with regard to Jerusalem by killing one of the false prophets there, but he tells the people in captivity, and don't listen to the prophets there who say otherwise, because they're prophesying what you caused them to prophesy. You, they know what you want. They know what's going to put bread on their table. They're going to say exactly what they want, and it's not what I said. So don't listen to these people. Um, interestingly enough, at the end of all of this, um, word gets back from the captivity to Jerusalem to tell the, the current high priest, the Lord hath made thee a priest in the stead of Jehoiada the priest, that they should, they should be officers in the house of the Lord for every man that that's mad or that maketh himself a prophet and that thou shouldest put him in prison in the stocks. Now, wherefore hast thou not reproved Jeremiah of Anathoth, which maketh himself a prophet to you? For he said unto us in Babylon, saying, The captivity is long, build ye houses, and dwell in tents, and plant gardens, and eat the fruit of them. And Zephaniah, <laughs> rather the priest, rather than doing anything, just goes and reads the letter to Jeremiah, like, this is what he's saying about you. <laughs> then came the word of the Lord to Jeremiah. <clears throat> Send to all them of the captivity, saying, Thus saith the Lord, considering Shemaiah the, no, the Helamite, the false prophet on the other end, because the Shemaiah hath prophesied to you, and I sent him not, and he's caused you to trust in a lie. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will punish Shemaiah the, the Helamite and his seed. He shall not have a man to dwell among this people, neither shall he behold the good thing that I will do for my people, saith the Lord, because he hath taught rebellion against the Lord. And then the story goes on in bits and pieces throughout, of course, the rest of Jeremiah until we get to the final fall of Jerusalem. 
But people on both ends don't really want to believe this. They believe that God's judgment couldn't possibly last that long. I mean, what have we really done to deserve this? Aren't we God's people? I, I think 70 years just sounds pretty short after our time <laughs> in Egypt. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're, we're, we're faced with understanding then the theology behind this, which is simply to say, understanding the God who would do such a thing and say such things. How is it that God uh, banishes his people into the world, the most worldly, worldly kind of world, <laughs> back to Babylon, not just someplace nearby like Ur of the Chaldees. They're, they're in Babel. And the ziggurat that they can look up and see is was built where the original Tower of Babel stood. Why does God do that to them? I mean, sure, they made a few missteps, they had some mistakes. Okay, they sinned here and there, but they're the covenant people, right? And God's kingdom is going to win. So, and then there's this pray for the city. What? These people are pagans. What do you? What do you? Not just the, not just pray for the people individually. You know, we, we're we're used to proselyting Gentiles and making them God fears. We we can understand that maybe, but you want us to pray for the city as a city. A community, a society with government and and street sweepers and dog catchers and uh, a court that sits at the gate and businesses and finances and currency. You want us to pray that all of that goes... These people are your enemies, Lord. What in the world are you telling us? Is this really God talking? Is this somebody else? This is one of the guys in the office making a joke. We don't get this. So. Um, I'm, I'm going to throw it back at you two for a few minutes because I don't have an immediate place to go here, and I think you will have some good things to say. How how would if you were there? How would you answer these people? What would you have? Do you have somewhat to say on behalf of God? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't help but notice the the way that we as Reformed believers sometimes fall into the same sort of fatalism Hmm. when we're dealing with the unbelieving world. Um, Like we have this very strong sense of the antithesis between God and the world. And we know that finally there will be a very clear distinction between the elect and those who are rejecting God. And it's easy to sort of skip to the end of the story (laughs) and not consider that the elect have to come to believe. <laughs> like they're elect from God's perspective. He's the one who chose them. Um, yeah. From our perspective, it's still, we need to be out there making disciples, spreading the, spreading the gospel to those who will hear it for the first time and believe. Brian, what do you think? Yeah, I definitely agree. I think there's a, a strong tendency for us to basically say, well, you know, well, we really have a, a hyper Calvinizing instinct in us, <laughs> which is to we say, like to go to the extreme really? of whatever we do. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, as humans, as human beings, it's like we just have a tendency to be like, "Well, you know, que sera, sera. What will be, will be. God's going to bring it all together the way He wants." And who am I to get in the way of that and you know mess up His divine plan with my meddling? But um, yeah, there there is a very real sense in which. It's not entirely just moral um, sanctifying to say, screw society, I'm going to go live on my own. (laughs) Because society is where sinners are, and we're called to preach the gospel to sinners. We're supposed to be where they are, not just on a weekend on a soapbox on the street corner, although that can help. That can be a good thing. But, uh, you know, actually being with them and interacting with them. Of course, when you have the instinct to say, well, let's just go out in the country and live by ourselves and be holy there, you end up finding out, oh, there's uh, sinners out here, because there's society (laughs) out here too, because there's people out here. (laughs) And they are me. (laughs) And they are me. (laughs) But yeah, it's... um, yeah, we have we have a very strong instinct to um, stealing a term from I don't know exactly where to imminentize the eschaton. I think <laughs> that um, I believe that's a philosophy of history term. I believe it is too. 
But uh, you know, we we have that that instinct in us um, as believers of a certain stripe, and we have to we have to really fight that sometimes. Uh, sometimes less so. I mean, sometimes there are people even within our own tradition that are they find it very easy to go into society and uh, and spread the gospel and talk about faith and uh, make disciples of all nations. But um, yeah, there's lots of there's lots of talk right now. Me being the only one who is lurking still on Twitter um, <laughs> about something called Christian nationalism, and mm. it's gone in a very short time, like in nine months, it went from that doesn't exist, none of us believe that, to oh, here's a book we wrote defending it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and published in Moscow, Idaho, to the surprise of no one. Unsurprisingly. Mm. And, you know, you, you look at that and you think, well, that's obviously, you know, you read them and you think that the, 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 this instance of it, this particular formulation of it is a little bit out there, uh, theologically speaking, logically speaking. But at the same time, you have to say, well, but yeah, we should we should be trying to make the individuals of a of a nation Christian. We should be making disciples, and we should be good citizens of the nation that we're in, and seeking the good of the Commonwealth. Uh, although trying to avoid the connotations the Commonwealth has had in history and <laughs> a lot in political history. Yeah, I don't know exactly where that thought was heading, but <laughs> there, there's a lot of words for you. <laughs> uh, oh, I. Uh... Google courtesy of Wikipedia, the ah. don't imitize the eschaton. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, modern usage of the phrase. I'm just reading Wikipedia here. <laughs> Started with <laughs> Eric Vogelin in the New Science of Politics in 1952. Conservative spokesman William F. Buckley popularized Vogelin's phrase. Ah, really? I did not know that. That's okay. so interesting. I only know it from a from discussions of. Um, a particular stripe of post-millennialism and uh, a meme where it's just like a machine called the Escatron 2000. <laughs> and there's a big button that says eminentize. <laughs> oh, you One know, I, my... I'm horribly afraid that we've lost some people with that. I, 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 I try, <laughs> let me try to explain as best. I understand what the phrase means. Uh, the Escaton, Escaton is simply the Greek word that means the Greek, yeah, that means yes. yes, that means the end, which which throws really frightening light on Eschaton Village, a retirement community for yeah, uh, <laughs> that's yeah. always weirded me up a little bit. <laughs> uh, but I'm driving to, past uh, that and thinking that's dark. <laughs> <laughs> to immunitize the Eschaton would mean to bring the end with all of that that means right into our presence, plop it down in our laps. To identify the end of history and the end of time and the goal of everything with our current existence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Speaking of Christian nationalism. Yeah. And there's a number of ways you could go about that, anywhere from blowing up the world to establishing <laughs> the final order that will endure mm-hmm. through all eternity. It's, it's, it's a phrase that it, it's at odds with scripture. In that mm-hmm. God has a plan, and the plan ticks off day by day, year by year, century by century, and yeah. we can't rush it. Mm-hmm. And those who try, who try to bring, whether it be utter desolation, Armageddon, or some kind of Christianized utopia, about now, they're not thinking like Christians. They're yeah. not thinking like covenantalists. They're not thinking organically. They're trying to mechanically or magically make it all about us right now, we're going to create eternity in a pot on the stove right now, and it's going, and and this will be it. This will be the defining moment for all of time, which will now melt into eternity because this is it. We got it. And it it can be the destruction of the planet, or it can be the salvation of the planet, but depending on your view of what's better, I suppose. So Mm -hmm. that's that's what's going, that's that. Jeremiah's not that. Of Mm -hmm. how you, when you put the timeline in your classroom as a history teacher. Yeah. You don't end with the year 2022. No, I don't. <laughs> I learned that a long time ago. Oh. And then I went through some interesting relationships with people who were very pro-nationalist and did see America as the end of history, in both, inter- both as the stopping point and the goal. So I, I've learned that when I draw a timeline, 
I, I bring it through the future, extend a little bit, or through the present, extend a little beyond, and then, we'll, then do a dot, 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 <laughs> and stretch it a lot further. I also tend to insert the Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire, and then America's history. <laughs> All of, you know, three, 200, well, 300 years, depending on how you measure it. And then here's this thousand year Byzantine Empire <laughs> with its roots in a 500 or so odd year Roman Empire. It's like, okay, guys. <laughs> We're on. the and new kids on the block. Yeah. <laughs> and it's also interesting just because throughout the history of Christendom in particular, uh, since Pentecost, every major empire that has been part of Christendom has said, "Oh yeah, we're we're the end all, yeah. we're the end." <laughs> because how could it ever get higher than three hundred eighty Rome? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and we're you know seventeen hundred years on from them. You you got to think bigger. <laughs> yeah, and and what doesn't fit is casting things in Reformation terms. Going to Rome and buying a house and living in the shadow of the papacy for 70 years. And yet that's sort of what God, God did not ask Israel to do that. God made Israel do that. They sent them <laughs> to Babel. They sent them into the territory of the Antichrist as he was manifest in the moment in the person of this guy, Nebuchadnezzar, to whom God says, obey him. This is not far from God saying, obey the Antichrist. Pray for him. Pray for his kingdom. Uh, sweep the streets. Shovel the snow. Uh, give presents to your Christmas presents. Hanukkah presents. Uh, <laughs> Passover presents. Hanukkah hasn't even happened <laughs> That's yet. That's <laughs> true. To your, uh, you know, to your mail carrier. Uh, babysit for the neighbor. Take the old lady across the street. A hot meal. Uh, and and yeah, those prostitutes who are gathering down there. You might ask the cops to do something about that, or maybe you just go down there and evangelize them. Uh, in other words, have a practical, realistic input into this pagan culture. But it, here's the thing back of all of this. And this is what everyone tends to forget. We, we, we confess it in our creeds. We fight for it when the subject of creation and evolution come up, and yet practically we ignore it. God owns the world. <laughs> that, play, that piece of ground, I, it does not matter that the Babylonians had conducted magic ceremonies on it and established a temple to a false god and it had all kinds of idols. It's God's land. He owns it. He yep. has plans for it. We still don't know the full extent of those plans. And and he he's not impressed. When the devil comes along and squats, <laughs> God is not, oh no, he's, he's squatting on my land. I guess oh, I have no, to yield to him. Okay, no ground. one go near that because the devil's been there. <laughs> You know, yeah. it, it could be bad, and I don't know that I could control that. He has claims. We've got to, got to, got to allow the devil his claims. <laughs> yep. Oh, come on. Is God <laughs> the creator of the universe? Is he the owner of the universe or not? And if he owns it, then what's wrong with him asserting his sovereignty, his claims, his sovereignty, even over a pagan land? And this is something that really, on a more intellectual and sophisticated level, still bothers theologians today. How mm. could God possibly bless press, cultural claims, legal claims, political claims against, say, the government of the United States and its culture, or that of the Soviet, <laughs> uh, former Soviet Union, or Russia and its culture, or China and its, I mean, it, it's not like God owns all this or, wait, <laughs> okay, maybe, God, maybe the father owns it, but the son doesn't because- um, um, All authority? Kevin yeah, Andrew? well, let's, let's just go back to the, he's God. What are you saying? Yeah. <laughs> what kind of Trinitarian heresy is this mm -hmm. <laughs> that says the Father has one kingdom and the Son has another kingdom? Yeah. Well, there's a kingdom of creation, a kingdom of redemption. And apparently the Father and Son only have, they send notes back and forth occasionally. <laughs> but it's not the same kind of rule, nor for the same sorts of goals. So yeah, in the Father's kingdom, be, be nice to your neighbors. In the Son's kingdom, go and evangelize them. Uh, you can, you can, um, this feels like you can squinting do both. and crossing your eyes to see two things where there's <laughs> only one thing. Yeah. Crossing and, your uh, eyes, it's very close in front of you. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and, and so as we look at this, we, we need to remember that this is not a side issue or a side note. Jeremiah is not a common grace prophet. He's a messianic prophet. All, all everything he has to tell us is in terms of the coming Messiah. Now, he gets the bad news 
Yeah, Messiah is coming, but first there's this, what will seem to you like a detour of 70 years. But you know what? That has a plan. So does all of this. Because when these people go there to Babylon and to um, Ekbatana or Cairo or Alexandria at the time, um, well, not yet, but eventually, uh, or Damascus or the Greek city-states or eventually to this faraway place called Rome, they're going to, if they do what Jeremiah says, they're going to settle down, they're going to build houses, they're going to plant gardens, they're going to have orchards, they're going to eat, they're going to have, they're going to build a family. And when the call comes in 70 years, okay, come on home. Guess what? They're not all coming. They're going to stay there because now after 70 years, this is home. Oh no, God's plan just failed. They're supposed to all come back because that's, it's all about the promised land. Well, these are like the first, not maybe not the first hints, but uh, a strong hint towards the inclusion of Gentiles in the New yeah. Covenant. It's not you, only you a, can, go ahead. Yeah, you can just, you can see that the heart of God is for his people to be included from yeah. all nations. It's not just, it's not just Israel. It's not that. They have been set aside, obviously, as a as a nation of priests, just like uh, believers are. But at the same time, he's not saying, okay, there is a holy political nation, mm-hmm. and nobody else is included unless they become a sovereign citizen of <laughs> that nation. Yeah. Uh, everything else is satanic. You know, if you if you uh, are in Celtic ireland or something you're you're doomed forever because you are not a member of the israeli state uh (laughs) it is meant to spread beyond the borders of israel yeah so two things then first of all immediately pray for these people what are they to pray for well the most obvious thing is that they come to put their trust in the god of israel their evangelistic prayers now not only that they should pray for their health you know their arthritis their rheumatism the plague that sweeps through, um, the little child who gets lost and no one can find her. You know, they pray for everything, every every aspect of God's good gifts to people. But the the primary thing they're going to pray is, may these people come to know you, O Lord, and wait for our Messiah as you do. That doesn't mean they have to become Jews, but god will do just fine. But the second thing is that all of these communities spread across the entire world that they knew are the places the apostles are going to stop first to dispense this gospel of salvation. These these are forward bases of operations for Messiah's plan of conquest. These are the places the apostles are going to go to preach the gospel and to gather the nucleus of church after church after church and city after city after city. And so the very moment when people are saying, you're sending us into exile, that's defeat. Oh, well, you're going to call us home, but people aren't coming. That's defeat. No. Actually, you're recon scouts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you don't know it because God has not briefed you on it because he doesn't want to. <laughs> he actually doesn't want to tell you the long game plan. Isn't that strange? You know, shouldn't it all be right there in scripture so that we can <laughs> check off century by century, decade by decade, what the king of the north is going to do and what the southern confederacies are going to do and who this beast and daniel is going to be shouldn't that all be just perfectly plain to us you know it would just be so much more easy if uh, agatha christie told us who the murderer was on page (laughs) (laughs) yeah that way i don't have to think and i can't and i I won't be in any kind of trepidation as i come to the end to be afraid that and i won't be wrong about who i think it is which is very important oh yeah that is incredibly important Uh, our pride is the most important thing yeah yeah so that that was sarcasm (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, I I, I, I think I, our, our listenership can. Our, let's, our listeners, I'm sure, <laughs> we have very got smart that. listeners. Yeah. Uh, here's a quote from Philip Ryken, um, Presbyterian uh, commentator. He says, "Seeking the peace of the city means being a good neighbor. It means shoveling the sidewalk. It means cleaning the street. It means planting a tree. It means feeding the poor. It means volunteering at the local school. It means greeting people at the store. It means driving safely and helping people with car trouble. It means shutting down immoral businesses. It means embracing people from every ethnic background with the love of Christ." But he goes on to make it clear, but that's not all there is. And he says this by themselves, random acts of kindness cannot bring a peace that endures. And then he goes on to talk, of course, about the gospel. 
But if if gospel preaching simply becomes putting another notch in my belt for the soul I want, well, the soul thanks you very much, but you're producing a distorted version of the love of Christ and of the kingdom of God. Okay, I got you. I brought you to Christ. You made a confession. There's a church over there. Go, 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 go be part of it. I got, I got more souls to win. I don't think he, Paul even did that. I think he, even those who have a, a primary call to evangelism and missionary activity, don't stop there because the, the, the command is make disciples, mm-hmm. not just win souls, well, as basic yeah. as that is, but win, make disciples. And that requires relationship. It requires treating people as people, caring mm-hmm. about their health and their finances and their homes and their children and all of that. And if we're going to try to to witness to our neighbors or the person at the store, whatever, the guy in the street, uh, we have to be able to talk to them. We have to care. The guy, I'm reminded of my my middle daughter, who I, I always get this story wrong, but it's something like this. Uh, having had a little fender bender with a, a gentleman, she drove off and then realized, oh, wait. I didn't. Sh- I didn't share Jesus Christ with him, and then turned around and drove back to the scene of the accident, <laughs> where the guy was still sitting there, and said, "By the way, I didn't tell you about Jesus." <laughs> and went on to share That's the gospel. Amazing. Well, I love this that. this one's even funnier. One and funny in a good sense. Um, she was. She'd overslept her alarm a few days ago, and um, the phone rang. Fortunately for her, got her out of bed. She, and she had to be someplace. But the guy on the line, I think, was some kind of telemarketer. She's kind of <laughs> vague in how she describes it. But he was a telemarketer who was having a really bad day and said, yeah, I'm just calling to, to annoy you. <laughs> <laughs> so he's an honest telemarketer. Yeah, he's an honest telemarketer. <laughs> and so she begins, to, oh, well, what's wrong with you? So you're having a bad day? Tell me about it. And before long, she's saying, let, let, yeah, that's a really right day. You know, do you know Jesus Christ? <laughs> she goes off <laughs> to evangelize this rather odd telemarketer. And uh, I, I think it went well for a while. I forget what she said something and eventually got him to hang up. But uh, and she wasn't because she was being rude. I think she just asked too personal a question about his mm. sin or something. I don't know. Uh. But that she's giving us those kind of very practical examples. Um, what does it mean to to be a good neighbor? Well, ultimately, it means to share the gospel with people, but it means to do it as a human, not as a robot. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we've all seen the memes of Reformed Christians sharing the gospel. God, <laughs> sir, God may or may not love you and may or may not have a... <laughs> Wonderful plan for your life. Yeah, let me hear. Let me tell you the gospel. Sovereign God predestinated some people to be saved through the death of His Son. You may or may not be one of them, but if you are and you are believe now, the yeah, sad thing is that way. sometimes it's true. Mm-hmm. Um, and and sometimes some people with with the best of intentions uh, who aren't really like that, they, they want to hurry things up. And sometimes it's. Y- y- you just need to treat the person like a person and just talk to them, move the conversation that way as you can, and then sometimes back off and sometimes take the detour with them. Know that, let them know that you care about them and you care about what they're thinking and you want to hear what they're thinking. There's this thing of our common humanity. And we say, well, but they're sinners and they're not elect. One, you don't know they're not elect. Two, yeah, they're sinners. Just mm-hmm. like us. This reminds uh, yeah. me of what we talked about last week with the microwave oven culture, mm. where we want things to be fast. Um, like even in that caricature of the reformed mm. evangelist, it's if you, if God predestined you to be saved, you will believe right now. Yeah, where, <laughs> you know, you don't know how much life that person has left and yeah. how, how long uh, the Lord has planned out for them before they come to believe. Um, but also the the way that we're accustomed to working in such a scripted cause and effect mm-hmm. framework with our microwave oven. You know, if your food doesn't get hot for some reason after one minute, it's like mm, my microwave is broken. <laughs> um, uh, it, and it's it's video games. It's yeah, like I play Stardew Valley. 
Um, <laughs> I've logged way too many hours on Stardew Valley. But part of the game is that you're this little farmer and you go around this little town and you get to know the villagers, right? Uh -huh. And they have all these idiosyncrasies and things they like and dislike. But you know the whole time it's a script. Right. Of course, because it's a video game. But I started to notice very early in the COVID lockdowns when I clocked way too many <laughs> hours every single day that it really colored the way I went about the rest of my life. It's like, if I do this, then that will happen. If I behave in this way, that person will respond in this way. Mm -hmm. No, <laughs> they're people. <laughs> they're not a script. Um, but the the way we interact technologically with mm -hmm. one another, I think can, I know at least for me, it can really get in your head in an unhealthy way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here I was looking at, the, speaking of scripts, I was looking at the original article and we're told to pray for the peace of our city. Here are some things that I, I, I noted and I'll just kind of skim and read. First, we should pray for the financial stability and well-being of our city. Think of COVID. Mm -hmm. When a lot of people, businesses closed down, restaurants particularly, and these are little mom and pop places, do we, do we pray and ask God to open them up and to give them favor with the eyes of the government and inventive ways of, of presenting their, their food, their services? Um, we should pray that there will be work for those who want it, charity for those who need it. We should pray for the business and industries that fuel our local economy, that they'd prosper, assuming, of course, that they're you know, not making birth control. Well, yeah, I'm going to go there. Birth control pills. <laughs> Anything that 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 creates an abortion, um, they that they would function ethically. Oh, there you go. That they would directly or indirectly be a blessing to the church. Second, we should pray for the safety of the city. We 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 don't want. We should not want to see our city destroyed by you know tornadoes and hurricanes and earthquakes and drought. We should thank God for domestic peace and pray that he will continue to restrain injustice, violence, and lawlessness within our city borders. I you know, friends, I've, I've had relatives who've lived in the middle of the territory between one gang and another. Yes, if you don't live in California, gangs are a real thing. <laughs> um, and they, they do things like shoot each other. And my sister-in-law at one point in her family had to, they, they heard the first shot and the, 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 what they every weapon yelled out was, get out! <laughs> as they continue to hear shots ring out down the street because, you know, we should pray that that doesn't happen, that these gangs get along or that they're converted or the police round them up or something, that this does not continue. We should, yeah. we should pray that he'll protect us from our enemies without and within. Third, we should pray for the officials of our cities, mayors, councilmen, department heads. It's easy to pray against them. And I know our own governor has been in for him, more than his share of imprecatory prayers. But we need to also remember to pray first for his salvation. And secondly, he's a family man. He's got a wife. He's got kids. He has health. He has responsibilities. I may not like the guy a whole lot, but that doesn't mean that we should not pray for him. Again, as a human being, as we would want people to pray for us, there's a, there's a marvelous section in screw tape that I've taken to heart a lot. I'm, I'm trying I'm trying to get to understand it. I think I've misunderstood it at times, but it, it amounts to this. When you, he's talking to, what's his name? Wormwood, the demon, junior demon. And saying, you know, when you're tempting your patient, the human being, um, get it, get it, it he's going to pray. Make sure when he prays for his mother, he always prays about the condition of her soul. Don't let him pray about her arthritis. Because what you're doing is you're creating a character in his mind who is largely artificial and unreal. The real woman has arthritis. Mm. But by abstracting the, her soul and its mm. sinfulness and her sinful behavior toward him and putting that kind of on one side on a shelf and forgetting things like she cooks your meals, she cleans your house, she has arthritis, she has her own problems. And we don't pray for that too. We're praying for a non-reality. Mm -hmm. And it becomes easier and easier to pray for the idealized mother while you're slapping the real mother around in a very physical, literal sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Screwtape makes a remark of I've, I've known patients who were 
able to be praying to God one moment, one moment and slapping their wives the next because you so separated this theological religious ideal of saving a soul from the real person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as we pray for our county and state and federal officials, it's 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 easy to mock them, to get uh, satirical and sarcastic about them. Uh, God did not say to do that with Nebuchadnezzar. Mm -hmm. He said, submit, and he says, pray. And so we need to maintain a balance there. And Paul says much the same thing, that we should pray for kings and all those in authority so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, 1 Timothy 2. And then finally, we should pray for the people of the city. We should pray that the gospel will reach every soul, that the churches will be faithful in their worship and witness, that whole families and neighborhoods would turn to Christ and know his peace. We should pray for revival, renewal, and reformation. But as long as we're convinced this is a pagan land, these are pagans, and I don't like them, and I don't really even care if anything good happens to them, then we've got an issue. And it's so unlikely. Like Jonah. Yeah, yeah, remarkably like Jonah, in fact. So I guess the motto here is don't be Jonah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Be more like and with Jesus. that, we should make some recommendations. Okay. Yep. I have one because I put it on hold from last week. So okay. What, is, what, what, is, your, what is your um, thing? This is my hot toddy recipe. Oh, okay. Um, it's not a legit hot toddy, which I think if you're a purist is like whiskey and sugar and lemon juice or something. Um, this is hot apple cider um, mm. with a shot of caramel vodka. Smirnoff, Whoa. and a shot of bourbon. Ooh, okay. So like, it's okay. like a 12 ounce drink if you do <laughs> an ounce each of the liquors and then the rest of your mug full of hot cider. It's very That sounds incredible. Nice on a on a cold evening. Do you want to go Brian, next, I got, Greg? I, I got nothing. No, do you have anything? Okay, I, I do have something. All right, you so. go, and I'll continue to think while you're doing Actually, that. I had two things, and I forgot the second one, but I, that means I still have one. Um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I am going to recommend Believing in the Creeds, mm. which should be a standard thing, um, but the, the background for this is uh, apparently there are two individuals from a particular uh, shared ecosystem uh, of ours uh, as Reformed believers. Uh, and one of them is pressing the other one. They're both fairly well known, and I'm just going to avoid names because I. That makes this a subtweet, though, and I'm just opposed to that on principle. <laughs> Very well. This is then a I public forum. They're I public will name names. You can um, name names, but then you have to come up with a, a real recommendation that's not a don't be like them. <laughs> but the recommendation is, is to be a historically minded Christian who <laughs> believes what the church has always believed. So just be better. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, uh, okay, fine. I'll come up with a different one. That's better. Um, anyway, uh, the, the two people in question are sadly Gary DeMar and oh. Kenneth Gentry. Um, what? Ken Gentry is okay in this, in this particular instance. Uh, I don't know him as well as I know of. I, I don't stuff. know if I've ever heard his name. Wow. <laughs> but uh, I, I only know him. Oh, yeah, I, I I know of him. In fact, he was uh, I, my fam my extended my extended family has a very close connection with him that I won't go into. But okay, continue. In any case, um, Gentry's been pushing Demar for an answer on a question, which the question is: Do you think that there's a physical resurrection oh, at the no. end of history oh, no. and a future return of Jesus Christ? Mm hmm. And DeMar's this should been be dodging the question. question. That, that should not require dodging. No, it Gary DeMar's been dodging, which is odd because there's been many things he's written that are, are very excellent. I mean, uh, is he the one who's written? I forget. Was he the guy who was an economist or is that the one who passed away recently? No, that, that's no, that Gary, Gary North. No, Gary, Gary DeMar North. traveled in those same circles. He wrote <laughs> the God and Government series that we that's right. used to some extent at school. He wrote Last Last Day's Madness, which is a good critique of just modern dispensationalism. But yeah. you know, and I hate to say this, but unfortunately, I was afraid that might this might be the case. I don't have mm -hmm. anything to point at and say, look, this is heresy. I just have that you talk all about eschatology, and this seems to not be something you're talking oh. about, which is a little bit odd. 
Yeah, more than a little bit odd. When hyperpreterism was a thing, um, yes. you know, 10, 15 years ago, there it, 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 it went in directions that were surprising. People you would think should know better caved on it or kissed up to it or had trouble seeing what was so bad about it. And as you say, the, the, the church for 2,000 years has agreed. Now, here's the thing. Oh, the church says, well, what about the Bible? The church says it because the church has been reading the Bible for 2,000 years. Thank you. That means there are millions of Christians who, having read the Bible, say that it says this, opposed to you handful of people who've read the, been reading the Bible for 20, 30, 40 years and say that. Yeah. Who should we believe here? Who do we think has a better handle on the Bible? 2,000 years of Christians who have read it faithfully in churches and church councils and hymn writers and commentators and theologians. Or you newfangled people who think you found something new and cute. Yeah. Um, when we start talking about the creeds, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the priesthood of the believer. We're talking about the perspicuity of scripture. We're talking about the ability of the average common believer to read the Bible and understand it. Because if we lose that, we lose everything. And we get a whole new priesthood of people who know the special hermeneutic that allows them to get truth that everyone else has missed. And it's bad when it happens in Genesis 1, and it's bad when it happens yeah. in Revelation 21, and so on. Uh, the, there are some things the Bible is clear about. And, and when we say, the Creed say, we're not setting up a separate authority, we're acknowledging the authority of Scripture to talk to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I, I hope also, Gary has not gone that way, but unfortunately, I'm, I'm worried. I, I also him. listened to a podcast where he was a guest, and unfortunately, it he, he said something about, it's like, oh, it's very hard to, to coexist in, in some churches that, that hold different beliefs about XYZ uh, with regards to the eschaton. He says, my daughter came home from school one day and said, oh, daddy, daddy, you don't understand. They're saying Christ is coming back in the future. I was like, yes, yes, I know, but you have to deal with that. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no! Oh, All right. I don't. I don't like to traffic in uh, in gossip, which is why I listen to the podcast instead of believing what people said. Yeah, you know, I appreciate that, Brian. And, uh, um, this is so bad news. I'm it is very bad is news. Bad I'm news. sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry to be the <laughs> recommendations. The place yeah, for sad we, things. Tell us something you like. <laughs> good things. Yeah, I, and, I will and, recommend. And, and it's good to be sad. It's not mm -hmm. good to erupt in righteous rage yeah. and name calling. Mm -hmm. uh, he has he has served the church faithfully in many ways. And we yeah. can hope this is a blip in his understanding that he'll recover from. Yeah. Yet we can say, you know what? You're wrong. Yep. It doesn't mean we hate you, it just means you're wrong. Yeah. And we can pray for that. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh bringing it back up from the valley that I just plunged this <laughs> into. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to recommend uh, Christmas markets if you are oh, in an yeah. area oh, that good. has them, because uh, here in Wisconsin, where I live, Wisconsin, where I live, <laughs> uh, there's a town about 20 minutes out of the way from where we are uh, that has a big German Christmas market, and it's basically a place for all these places uh, from around Wisconsin to come and hawk their wares that are vaguely Christmas themed. <laughs> or not even Christmas themed. They're just <laughs> stuff. Uh, stuff you can they, buy for Christmas for people. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. And there's like, this year, it, it was like, um, they had pork schnitzel on buns and German potato pancakes. Like, they had a food section. Um, and everything was really good. And malt wine. And yeah, it's just, it's a fun activity. It's only open, this one in particular, for like 10 days. And it's really great i mean we did it last year uh shortly after like two months after we got married and we did it this week with my um brother-in-law and his wife and it was just fun it was a good time nice merry christmas <laughs> well and in the light of that i think i'm going to recommend celebrating christmas You've I think triggered are... all the Puritans who are listening to our podcast. <laughs> yeah, all two, all of two of them. <laughs> <laughs> there are uh, the the reluctance to celebrate Christmas. I think can, can come from two different directions. One is a religious thing, and that's actually not really what I had in mind. Mm -hmm. I, I know I have known people who either downplay any kind of Christmas celebration, and I've known people who flat out say it's sinful. 
how this squares with Paul saying that he who regards the day regards it to the Lord, and you should not pass judgment. I am not sure. Well, it has all these pagan elements. Yeah, you know, I mean, like Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, like <laughs> Venus, Mars, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, like... Um, like the country where you live. <laughs> like the country where you live. Um, it, it, it just, to me, seems a very narrow-minded, hypocritical, inconsistent uh, hermeneutic that, that goes that way. On the same... Uh, now, if you just don't want to do it, that's your business, because it does work both ways. And so this is a recommendation, not a requirement. You're not a bad Christian if you don't celebrate Christmas, on the assumption that he who regards not the day regards not the day to the Lord, that all days are alike because you've given them all to Jesus. And that's that's another way of, of looking at the Christian life. But what I'm I think I'm looking more at right now is as you as the kids move out and the grandkids aren't around, it can, can become very easy to just get tired of it to get tired of the hustle and bustle, to get tired of the shopping, and mistake the externals for the reality and just say, I just don't want to do any of that. So we're not, I don't know, I'm not playing Christmas music. We're not sending Christmas cards. We're not saying Merry Christmas in the store. I think that's a mistake. Here is an opportunity to think back on one of the most important things in redemptive history, the incarnation and birth of our Lord. And here is a time within our culture when it's still okay for now to say it out loud. And most people will not get offended. I've already been greeted any number of times with happy holidays. And my response, if I'm on my toes, is always Merry Christmas. <laughs> and more often than not, I get a smile or a thumbs up or, a, well, Merry Christmas to you too. Um, there's because I think a lot of people are just tired of the political correctness. And there are a lot of Christian brothers and sisters out there, or those who grew up in Christian homes and still have some, some memory of what that's all about. And this is an opportunity when we can remind them, even with just a few words. And it's a time when we can play music. Yes, there's some, <laughs> some, guy, with, some guy with a reindeer running over grandma, you know, and some kid losing his two front teeth and all that. But there's still an awful lot of Christmas music that preaches the gospel in no uncertain mm -hmm. terms. And it yeah. gets played in secular stores still. Yeah. And the opportunity for caroling, when our school's gone caroling, we have gone to the post office. We've gone to City Hall. Nobody has ever, no one, no official organization has ever turned us away. In fact, the City Hall says, can you come at this time so more people can hear you? <laughs> and and a couple, I think the last time we tried this, oh, it's so great you're coming to see us, but there's this other little branch of, of, of our operations that's over there. Could you go see them? Because no one ever goes and sees them. And unfortunately, we couldn't because of the how you get the logistics just didn't oh, work out logistics. for us. But it, here are wonderful opportunities to remember what Jesus has done, to talk to other people, to celebrate it. Yeah. But you don't have to go endure Black Friday. You don't have to have a shopping list with 20 million items on it. You don't have to break your bank account. You don't have to eat any kind of Christmas cookie or candy that you don't like. <laughs> yeah. but, Unless your grandma made it. <laughs> yeah, there, there's that. In which case, uh, you probably have to eat them all year round. Uh, but it's not it's, a Christmas thing. There are wonderful <laughs> things here and wonderful opportunities. And even if you don't believe in celebrating Christmas... That doesn't mean you can't make use of some of these opportunities to be yeah. a faithful witness and to enjoy the goodness of God, uh, even in this late secular age of ours. One of the things I always find interesting from the people who religiously do not observe Christmas mm -hmm. um, is that they're still letting the church calendar determine what they preach on. It's uh -huh. just the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> Like, all right, we Our know that December 25th <laughs> is not the day to teach on, you know, the resurrection. It's like, or not the resurrection, the uh, incarnation. Yeah. Uh, that's the one day you can't do it because otherwise they'll think we're doing a Christmas sermon. <laughs> yeah. I've, yeah. I've belonged to a think. couple of churches that don't, don't do a Christmas Eve hmm. anything. They don't yep. really change up their liturgy. And I enjoy it. I, yeah. I like that it it's just continued peace like sundays are a peaceful day and we're mm, continuing yeah. to have the peace of christ um but i it was funny in the church that i went to in college 
the pastor was like, yeah, I've, I've never preached an Easter sermon, except for that one time when we were preaching through the Gospel of Luke and it just sort of happened. <laughs> it was <laughs> Easter Sunday and there I was at the resurrection. It's like, well, the Lord did that one for you. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, thank you guys so much for this conversation. It's been a delight. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to you, our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can send us an email at haltingtowardsion at gmail.com. Thank you also to our financial supporters. Uh, we appreciate you keeping the show rolling. If you'd like to join their number, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash haltingtowardsion, or our Patreon, patreon.com slash haltingtowardsion. And yeah, send us an email because we want to hear from you. Merry Christmas. The end. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.